Hello everyone, thank you once again for tuning in to the Rad Movement on YouTube. Uh, today, I meet up with a friend of mine, Rachel St. Dennis, who works for Livewire Magazine, which is a magazine local to Melbourne, Florida. Their Instagram is LivewireFL, LivewireFL. Uh, check that out to get your copies of a magazine recently that I was in. Um, they talk to me, well, me and Rachel talk about, uh, you know, my life in Melbourne as a tattooer, uh, all leading up to everything that has happened in the past recent years. So it's a really cool chronicling of my story and where I've been, some of the things I've gone through locally and, uh, you know, around. And, uh, so I videoed the interview of her getting the information uh, so here is that interview that she took the information and turned into an interview for the magazine. So I figured it would be a fun way to bring them both together. So here is my interview live with Rachel St. Dennis from Livewire Magazine in Melbourne, Florida. Uh, Livewire FL on Instagram if you want to get yourself a copy. And uh, thanks for checking it out. Have a great day, y'all. Y'all are fucking rad. I love you time ago, obviously, um, when you had um, the other shot, when you, you were exploring. No. <laughs> no. I wasn't going to go there. <laughs> no. I mean, but, you, you know, it is a thing. When you had the other shot, which <laughs> was Ink Doctors, right? On US1. Oh, the one on US1. So that was Chapel of Love Private okay. Studio. Okay. So I had Chapel of Love in downtown O'Galley on Highland. Then we moved it around the corner to where Little Attitudes is, and then that was okay. Chapel of Love. Um, very poor management, uh, <laughs> and, and, you know, uh, at that point, and I was urged to close the shop uh, directly after our grand opening. Oh. So okay. we put like 30 grand into the shop, and then had a two day long grand opening, and then closed it. Sure. Then it was like, well, let's go to this little private space we were splitting it with K for like $300 a month was like the total rent. Oh, right. The, in the plaza? Yeah. Okay. So um, yeah. that is, so then that was the one on, oh, here, oh, so Ink Doctors was on US1 too, though. It was Fox. with the house so, behind it, right? Shit. So, so now let's go back even further than I was just okay. talking about. Yeah. So let's go, let's go back <laughs> further because I, and I kind of want to just like go do like maybe a little timeline of okay. how you ended up where you are now yeah. and with what you're doing. So I think conversation we were just having maybe was after Ink Wait, Doctor talking, yeah. and I'll, Ink Master, right? Because you did, yes. that was... Ink Master um, happened after Ink Doctors. Right, right. During Chapel of Love in, on Highland in downtown O'Galley. Okay. So, okay, so moved here my senior year of high school with my mom and dad. Okay. Uh, that's where Ink Doctors came from. Um, Remember when the purple porpoise was over the side? I do. We were we were ink doctors in that. I think there's a burrito store now there. Yeah. So we were ink doctors in that shop. Um, they were there for about a year, and that's when I was like apprenticing, learning how to tattoo. Um, well, that was like the end of my apprenticeship because I was 16, and that's when I like started tattooing. Okay. Um, <laughs> and I was still in high school. Um, something with my age, where I graduated a year early because my parents managed to get me in. Like, it, I missed the cutoff date, but, like, I was smart enough to go to the next day. I don't fucking know what happened. But, like, early on in my life, I was able to graduate. It, it set me up to graduating high school a year earlier than everybody else. And then my last year in high school, I went to school half the day. I went to the shop half the day. So then I graduated high school in 98. We move Ink Doctors over Beachside on US1, the two-story house. Right. The two-story building. With the white, white building, pink awning. Yes. Uh, ink Doctors on the front of the building, and my parents' little house was out back. Okay. So then, from that point on, I don't remember how long we were there, but then we moved to a little yellow house on one on US one. Like it was like two properties over, and it had a smaller building for the tattoo shop, but a huge house. Okay. So my parents. I think that's the one I'm thinking of. The Close huge. To Sarno. They're both so fucking They're close, both to, close to Sarno. Dude. I'm thinking of the one with the really big house in the back. That's the yellow one. Yeah. That's yeah. the one after the second Ink Doctors. Okay. So that was the third Ink Doctors. And it was so weird that my parents, like, got a building 
with a business and a house like twice. Right. Like, yeah. That's unusual. Right down from each other. Yeah. And like the second was an upgrade. And the tattoo shop was really cool. Um, but yes, that's probably where we met was the yellow one. Yeah. Yeah. It was around that time. Yeah. And that was 2012 is when I left there. So I was there for quite some time before that. Okay. Um, and so were you kind of leaving that location at the same time that you got involved with the Ink Master thing? And how did that come about? How did okay. that come about? So I kind of want to touch on that a little bit. Right, right. Yeah. And your experience with it. Uh, it was a weird time. Um, it was a good time. It was a bad time. It was the best of times. So it was the best of times. <laughs> um, but yeah, so at that point in time, it was 2012 when I left Melbourne and went to Tennessee to live. That was around the time that they were casting season two of Ink Master. And I got really far in that, but then they didn't ask me to be on the show. So then like, just kind of let life be. Lived in Tennessee for a while, moved back to Florida. Then that's when I opened Chapel of Love on Highland. Okay. I had opened Chapel of Love on Highland, um, and I think I was maybe there for like a year or so. Then Ink Master comes about. and. Uh, I remember I was going to work at the shop that day, and I, but I was I was actually going to not work and drive to the open audition for Jacksonville in Jacksonville for season five, and I was like, I don't fucking feel like going, so I just didn't. Right. The timeline's weird, right? Yeah, I, yeah. I I don't remember exactly like how everything happened, but at some point in time, I remember being in the shop one night and being like, wow, I'm going to be on TV, and feeling this like weird like energy kind of explode from me and like kind of go out into the universe. It was fucking weird, man. I, I wish I could explain it better than that. <laughs> I was just like, I, and I was sitting there with the people that I was tattooing and it was that, it was late night. And I was like, huh, I'm gonna be on TV. Yeah, you kind of had a moment about that. Yeah. yeah, and then like shortly thereafter, I was going through, I was actually at the tail end of possibly losing my eyesight. Okay. Which was an autoimmune thing. My, my my immune system was confused and fighting against my eyeballs. Oh, yeah. interesting. Yeah. Um, and if you look into that, like energetically and spiritually, it was like a lot of things I didn't want to see. Okay. Um, that's when you have problems with your eyes. And in the spiritual world, that's like one of the things, right? Gotcha. Um, okay. Like, because I do a lot of hippy dippy shit, right? Like, you do some hippy dippy <laughs> shit too, so you get it. I so, you know, I'm not a, I'm not 100% hippie, and I'm not a 100% tough guy, you know, I just kind of yeah. work how I work. But yeah, so I was, it was hard because, like, I, I knew I wasn't supposed to be with my parents anymore, working wise. Um, I knew I had to break off, and then all the eye problems happened. And yeah. So then at the end of the eye problems, I remember, and this is why I remember, I was in one of my closer to the end eye doctor appointments, so they weren't as heavy and didn't stress me out, because every time I went, I got worse bad news for a while. Right. So now I got, I started to get better news. I had been on methotrexate for like two and a half years, so like, finally my eyes are clearing up. And they're like, she calls me and she's like, yeah, so uh, heard you have a brother that you don't like. I, mean, I, I was like, yeah, I hate that piece of shit. I'll beat his ass. She was like, oh, fuck Robbie, I love it, you're an animal. <laughs> then I find out it's for the rivals season. Okay. So that's why it's so great that Robbie hates his brother at this of point, course. right? Yeah, so yeah. Um, that's around the time that we opened Chapel of Love. It was a little after, like I said. Right. Uh, went to the Ink Master thing, and like that was weird because I had one of the dudes that was on the season with me was living in my house and working at my shop when we went. Okay. And I had just gotten done working at Longnecker's shop like a year or two prior, who was also on my season at this, at, as the dude that was working in my shop's rival. Okay. Uh, and then Maddie LaBelle, the bald chick from like season three or four, was moving into my house and my shop as I was going to film. <laughs> so it was really weird how there was so much like ink master entanglement in my right. life at that point in yeah. time. Yeah. Um, but that's kind of like another indicator like you're you're gonna do this, right? Right. Yeah. <laughs> so that was that. Uh, then I went, and that was one of the hardest times of my life. Yeah. Um, so I, you were, I mean, maybe kind of in a rough place at that time, and not. Yeah. Well, see that that and that, like all of that is like a part of the story to where the rat movement came from. Right. Um, so when I moved to when I went to Ink Master, um, the woman I was married to at the time, she got us into a different home. Uh, 
So when I came home the first night, I was like, where's our bed? So like, not only was I like, just at this ink master mind fuck pressure cooker, but now I come home to a house that's not mine. And I'm like, I don't even know where I live. So it was really weird. Uh, and I was, I was going to a point like, so when I got off Ink Master, I, I, I had this weird deep depression where I wanted to kill myself and wasn't able to talk about it for another year. Say, how were you kind of dealing with things mentally during that time? I mean, so we moved in, she moved us into that six bedroom house with a theater room and like it was real swanky and fucking giant and awesome. And like, I didn't feel like I deserved something so big and beautiful and awesome. We went and bought a special giant TV and fucking surround sound system, like, so we could watch Robbie on Ink Master when we weren't out at a party watching Robbie every week. Right. So it was, like, really hard for me to watch myself on TV because I was super insecure. Um, that was when I was really heavy, and I hadn't really, like, done the fitness thing that much yet. So I was starting to lose weight then, and, like, I was in a really rough place with losing weight and getting my life healthy. Um, I was in a really rough place thinking my career was going to end when I got home from Ink Master. Because, like, you feel like, oh, well, I, I lost the show, and everybody's going to realize I'm a fraud. Right. So imposter syndrome came up real, real deep. Um, the money management in the household wasn't in my hands, and it was being managed very poorly. Okay. Yeah. So, like, I had fucking, like, the repo guy coming to get my truck, and I didn't even know it. You know, and I'm like, I'm making 20, 30, 40 grand in a month in my shop. You know, like, why the fuck? Yeah, my can't... car is about to get taken, right? Because the money wasn't being allocated properly. Right. And then that's how the, end, the next shop ended up getting, you know, 30 grand to open it and then close, like, the day after. My, like, the night of my, my second part of the, gra the grand opening, we closed it. So, like, I'm having a grand opening party at a shop I know I'm going to close. Right. So things so. are just kind of snowballing a little bit. And, I mean, what, what was the... <laughs> Did you, um, you know, when you closed the shop, did you stick around Melbourne? Did you try to get a fresh start somewhere else at that time? So, um, closed the shop. I mean, obviously, it's ex-wife, so yes. there were a lot of changes that came yeah. after that point. A lot of changes. Um, you know, and it's part of my story. It's part of my journey. And, you know, I hadn't gone through that. I wouldn't come. I wouldn't be quite that. Right. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I take the responsibility because I handed over all the control yeah. uh, because I was afraid to handle money. Uh, I was an artist. I didn't want to cheat in my experience touching money. And so uh, <laughs> it was a weird time. So uh, then I went on a lot of walkabouts. Like, I'd go, like I went to Miami to go work in a shop for a week, um, staying at a friend's house at the time whose mom died. And it was the mom's house. So I'm like, Really weird shit, like, on my fitness journey, like, running in neighborhoods I don't know, just to try and get my exercise in. Staying in a house where, like, a woman, I don't know where she died in it, or, like, like staying in her bedroom and shit, living in her bed, it was weird. Right. Um, so that was odd. Working at a shop in Miami Beach, where Miami Beach isn't my vibe, you know, it's like... Definitely is <clears> a <throat> unique <laughs> vibe. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I did a lot of walkabouts, like I said. I'd travel around from place to place, and then, that small shop on US one uh, that me and your ex yes. uh, met in. Yep. So um, fucking, we were there. Like I said, the bills split in half for me and Katie at that place were like three hundred dollars each, like out the door. Right. So like, I worked at a shop that I could never lose. So perfect opportunity right. to get back on. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, and at that point, so. Rewind a little bit, in that big giant house when I was living there, I remember crying in the kitchen one day, on the floor, and just looking at my I'm Rad tattoo and being like, I can't read it, I can't see it, I don't see it, I don't see it, I don't see it. But I couldn't see that I was Rad, right? And so I Googled how to be happy. And then I found like Brendan Burchard, who was like the protege of Tony Robbins, and like the connection there for me was my dad used to read, read Tony Robbins, and so now like, I find his predecessor, or you know, his, his, uh, you know, the guy after him, <laughs> protege, right. you know. So like, and so that that kind of like gave me hope. And Brendan Burchard is nothing like me. He's like so like normal and like you know like American whitewashed dude, but his, his information is so brilliant. And um, I'm dying to meet him one day just to tell him how he fucking saved and changed my life. Yeah. Uh, 
And so like I started finding this motivational content. Well, now I'm pulling myself out of this rut. I'm wanting to kill myself way, way, way less. It wasn't like a constant thing. I wasn't like suicidal all the time, but like I remember when I had that feeling like I wanted to kill myself, I was like, fuck, I can't tell anybody about this. Right. Like, how, I, I, can't, I, can't, I can't be fucking suicidal and live life. This is fucking insane. Yeah. So I just hit it. You're trying right. to be successful. You're trying right. to, yeah, yeah. So then after some point in time, I started talking about that. That it's still weird for me to say the suicidal t- thoughts and stuff. So I started talking about it. Then I realized people, I, who the fuck is impervious to that? Right. You know, nobody's impervious to that type of fucking bad day. Bad month, bad year, bad whatever. So then I started realizing, okay, a lot of these guys I'm finding in this motivational space, they're great, and I resonate with them because I need what they have to say. But if I was the guy saying what they had to say, I'd probably hit a totally different demographic that they'll never hit. So then, like, being the extremist I am, I can't just be motivated. Now I have to go be a motivator. So, (laughs) (laughs) So... The rad movement was already cooking in my brain, you know, with the I'm rad tattoo. Right. Um, that was something me and my best friend Ozzy Devolt like just discovered on my back porch, late night drinking talks. Um, and uh, yeah, so I was like, okay, well, then I'm rad movement came around, and I started trying to get over my fear of the video, which word now Ink Master comes in because I did so much video there. Yeah. That like it kind of helped me. Yeah. Um, start, and so I started. Yeah. So then the rad movement comes alive. And I drug my feet on that for over 10 years, feeling like I couldn't actually do what I'm doing now with the coaching. And so like now I finally stepped into, okay, I am a healer, dare I say the word. You know, like I am a coach, I am a mentor, I am a leader. You know, and it's all these things that I've been afraid of accepting. You can hear like how uncomfortable it still is right. for me to say these things. But like now I'm realizing that the more you say that, the more others say, oh my God, me too. Right. I've been afraid to say that. Positivity. Right, yeah. yeah. You know, misery loves company, so love loves company. Right. Your joy loves company. Everything fucking loves company. Yeah. So, yeah, I don't even know what the question was at that point, but that was just kind of a well, but you're, unraveling. you're kind of creating a confidence in other people yes. by being confident yourself. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, so, I mean, obviously you're doing the podcast, mm-hmm. um, which is super cool. Um, Thank you. I'm done going to um, make sure to link all that stuff in the story, too, so cool. people can start following. I appreciate it, yeah. Um, obviously, I want to talk about the leg, okay? Because... <laughs> you mean... Um, this is a... Yes, this leg? Yes, that leg. <laughs> You know, this is a very unique circumstance that came up in your life. Um, I'm sure there was some very dark, dark times um, because of that. And Broke so, those waves. <laughs> yeah, um, kind of just like, you know, you can briefly, um, what happened. I mean, I know what happened, right. but. Um, you know, the human body suspension. It's one of my passions. If you don't know what that is, you can Google it. Or, uh, yes, when you put hooks in your back and pick yourself up, or hooks in your body and pick yourself up. Yeah. Um, the specific one I was doing was from the back. I had done forearms, butt, chest, back, and knees over my time. Uh, and I would do these as performances at conventions. So it was like kind of a regular Friday night. You know, I'm tattooing, and uh, these people with hooks in them come over and say, hey, Robbie, they need you. So, because I was always like tattooing, so I'd always be the last one to get my hooks. Right. Uh, because I'm really bad with time. Uh, I always push my limits. <laughs> <laughs> things always pop up and like, things require my attention. So uh, uh, I, get, I go, I get my hooks, I do my motivational speech, uh, and I go to do what I do. And on the A-frame that I was on, and you can see this on YouTube on this channel actually, um, uh, and I was on that, that A-frame rig, and I, I run into my suspensions partially because it looks cool, uh, partially because I've always wanted to before, like when I've seen other people do it, I was like, oh, that's so cool. And then like I wanted to do that, but then also it gets you off the ground faster. Um, instead of like being like, oh, pull me up. It's just like, fuck it, you run. Like slow descent. Right, yeah, whoever, whoever knows, everybody that does my ropes knows that when I run, you fucking pick up. So I run, I come off the ground, and I'm swinging, and I swung to one of the legs, 
was starting to climb up it because I like to climb it like a jungle gym and then like drop down. It's called a shock load where you take the pressure off the hooks and then put a really heavy pressure on them with that shock and it looks cool and people are like, whoa, and yeah. everybody thinks that your skin is going to rip. Well, this time the rope broke. Um, it's been said that it was uh, improper rigging coupled with uh, a rope that was meant to fly flags, not a rope that was meant to kill oh. people. Um, so there, were, there's a whole story behind I'm that, sure, I'm sure. and a yeah. lot of darkness there. Yeah. So, um, uh, long story short, break my leg off, wait what seems like forever for the paramedics to come. The one of them looks like my fucking oldest son, so I'm like, you look like Jaden. Probably looks fucking nothing like him, but my mind needed something. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, Comfort. Right, I, I didn't have insurance, I was terrified how I was going to afford this. Um, then the next day, fucking donations started rolling in, people made GoFundMe's, the guy that throws the conventions calls me, hey man, you gotta sue us, and I'm like, I don't wanna sue my friends. He's like, ah, it's fine, you're suing our insurance. Right. Uh, so then, overnight, going to a fucking, uh, what's it called, surgery, wake up with a cage on my leg. I'm thinking I'm gonna be out this bitch with a cast on in a couple days. Right. So like, that started the long string of surgeries over the next eight months. Uh, eight surgeries or so in eight months. The eighth surgery was my amputation. Uh, I would have loved to amputate way earlier. I made peace with it like the second month my leg was broken. Right. Saw, saw some shit on TV, three separate like stories in one night with amputees. And I was like, yeah, fuck this. Like, all right, cool, I guess. Let's just do it. Let's just yeah. do it. But the, okay. these doctors kept trying to keep it, kept trying to keep it. We were traveling around, so like a couple of the surgeries were just trying to keep the fucking infection away. Like, right. It, dude, it was wild. Right. So then, come back to Florida, because we were traveling all around in our RV at that point in time. Come back to Florida, uh, legs broken, going to the doctor uh, here. He's like, give me six months to a year and a half, and we'll put your leg back together. A couple weeks or a month go by, and then we decide to chop it off. Yeah. But like, I was going in for a regular routine checkup, and... Uh, Oh yeah, well, you're a perfect candidate for adaptation. I'm like, but what? Yeah. And he's like, yeah, man, sorry. Like, this is gonna be the best. You want to run? You want to be able to walk good? You want to be able to do all the things? Amputation is gonna be your your thing. So five days later, I had my leg amputated. So I went in on December 15th. Had my leg amputated by December 20th, and had the weirdest Christmas. Yeah, it's so fucking wild. Yeah. I mean, that's a really wild ride. And that was 2019. Started in May of 2019, ended January 2020. Because then the ninth surgery, um, they went in and fixed my nerves because I had such bad phantom limb pain that I wasn't going to make it. Right. I would imagine maybe losing it a little bit over that. I would have killed myself straight the fuck up, dude. I wouldn't have been able to live. Like, it was so much pain. So much pain. Worst pain I've ever been. Waking up in the middle of the night screaming, like, the only things that, that saved me was tattooing long, long sessions and having sex. Those are the only two things that right. took my mind far enough away yeah. to where I could live through the pain. But yeah, that was it. Even when I would sleep, I'd wake up just screaming every night 30 minutes. I mean, how, how, I would imagine that was a very depressing time. And, you know, I guess my question was going to be, how did you manage to stay positive through it all? But Sex and tattooing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's it. Sex and tattooing keeps me positive. Um, you know, Donna was always there from, from the start. Uh, she, I, I convinced her to go to a baseball game because one of our friends wanted us to go the night that I hurt myself. So like, she never wanted to leave my side from that point on. So <laughs> she was sleeping on the hospital floor and everything, so she was there for me. Amazing. Um, we had a puppy that... Uh, she went and got on Father's Day because I was having a bad day because I couldn't be with my son. So she went and got as a puppy. <laughs> um, but yeah, she was there supporting me. And like I would say one of the things, I was having a bad day, worried about losing my leg early on. And um, there was a team of doctors. And I was like, I don't think I'm going to do good, guys. Like, I'm having a bad day. And the one doctor, she was like, yo, I've seen your ad movement stuff. Why don't you just be your own guru? <laughs> like, and you're like, the fuck? <laughs> like, bitch, you don't even know what a loser I am, and that shit's bullshit because I'm not even a good person. So, like, you know, like, the rad movement has been a way to keep me in accountable check. and check. Yeah. yeah, so, like, 
I battled with imposter syndrome, still do. You know what I'm saying? So like, so like, I was like, oh, don't you tell me I'm good. I'll tell you how I'm bad. Right. You know? <laughs> and so that was kind of a wake up call for me. Like, all right, dude. And the whole time I was like, dude, you started the rad movement. If you ever want this to fucking turn into something, you have to walk the talk. Right. So Self-love. Like, yeah. Right, yeah. But mindset shifts, you know, focusing on what's... Dude, Brendan Burchard talks about focus and where you focus your attention is where your life goes. Right. So if you focus on misery, your life goes there. If you focus on at least hope during the misery, at least you'll focus on the fucking hope. You know what I'm saying? Right. So I just kept trying to focus on that. Then, like a year and a half go by after everything went down, and I get a fucking settlement, uh, you know, and I'm able to fucking bypass my bad credit uh, from bad decisions in the past, and I can buy a house now. And like, I had just opened the tattoo studio with all the money I fucking had, like, during COVID. So like, I, I didn't, the, the settlement didn't even come to help me open the shop. That was like an initiation that the universe needed me to feel. Yeah, yeah. So like I'm in here on that pink Do rolling chair. Do your own shit right now. Dude, yeah, yeah, and I'm on the fucking pink rolling chair. You're sitting on fucking mashing up fucking tile, fucking using a floor grinder, fucking with yeah. no legs. I didn't have prosthetic. So I'm just rolling around, fucking <laughs> grinding things. <laughs> fucking the day before my first prosthetic appointment, I was breaking tile off the bathroom wall and fell onto my nub. And it's like a baby when they hit their head. And like they stop for a minute and then cry. And scream, I'm sure. Dude, yeah. and I, I like sat there and I was like, because <laughs> now I'm worried. I think I'm getting my leg tomorrow. I didn't realize it's a slow process. Yeah. So like I go in and they start doing measurements and stuff. And I'm like, oh, I fell on it. Is it gonna fuck? Is it gonna work? Am I yeah. gonna? Yeah. 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 So you know, and the fear comes in. Yeah, yeah. And there's so much that went along with it. Like I, I can't do hallucinogens anymore, really. Um unless I'm in a place where I'm around safe people, uh, because I will fucking have a severe emotional break. Um, probably because I cover so much of that sadness right. uh, with having to live life. Um, and it's a sadness you'll never get rid of. Yeah. You know, like, I go in my pool and I don't have my leg on and I look down and I'm like, there's only one foot there, there's only five toes. You know, like, this toe is fucking getting all, like it's growing back because I dropped one of these big ass water bottles on it. And I'm mad as fuck, like, why didn't it have to happen to the one fucking thumb toe I have? Right. You know, like, why couldn't it happen on the fucking plastic foot? So, like, it's weird. It's very weird. But, like, tests you constantly, you know? It's, yeah. Constantly. <laughs> so, you know, and that's the thing, you know, you go through these initiations in life to get to where you're going. So that's how I made it. Yeah. Um, because I knew that if I was going to be the motivational guy, I had to fucking be it. Right. And if I wasn't going to be him, then I had to close down the rad movement. You know, I had to stop fucking, you know, trying to live out this dream of being a motivator, healer, uh, you know, whatever, whatever the fuck space I'm stepping into or have been in and haven't noticed it. Right. Like I had, I had to finally like have that come out like fertilizer is shit and it makes the flowers grow. So this was the fertilizer of my life at that point. Right. And, and now you're family man obviously you've got the new baby yes congratulations thank you for thank you adorable. it's weird too because my 21 year old like me and his mom split up early she went on a really hard ride with drugs for his whole life until uh he graduated from high school and now right. she's back and that's Jaden, right that's Jaden. Yeah. yeah so like it's really cool yeah i, I, I think i cut you off no no no. <laughs> I, think, I think i met uh Jaden maybe uh, way back when probably yeah, yeah. we're still married mm -hmm. yeah, yeah at that time um, he now lives with us in, in, in oh, Florida. Yes. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah. He's, it's he really, does his rap thing. Yes, okay, yes, so yes, yes, yes. JTL.Jado on Instagram. <laughs> um, JTLJado on all platforms. <laughs> uh, I'm actually helping manage his music career just because oh, cool. I understand art, I understand business, I understand people, and he's 21 and insecure about his shit. Yeah. So, he needs uh, guidance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's really cool. I feel like I'm in soccer mom mode. Yeah. You know, just like. <laughs> you are. Going to the shows with him, fucking big dicking around, fucking throwing out his merch and shit. Like, yeah, yeah, hey, JT, I'll old bitch. You know, and like, I'm me, so they're like, who the fuck is that guy? So, you know, it's, it's kind of cool, yeah. You're the hype man. Yeah. And the management. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the security bitch. Yeah. <laughs> 
But yeah, oh, it's, been I love really, that. I love that. it's been really cool. I'm having the new baby. He's almost four months old. Yeah. Um, his name is Zen. Uh, he can be Zen. He cannot be Zen. <laughs> of uh, course. But like, it's cool because you know, like, we we do family shit together. Yeah. Like, we sit down and watch Bar Rescue. That's one of our family things. <laughs> <laughs> we fucking love John. Yeah, everybody picks a show. Dude, yeah. Bar yeah. Rescue is our family show. Um, <laughs> but like. One time I was at one of Jaden's shows and Donna's like, hey, we should go on family walks. So like that started a thing. Um, now that she had the baby, we all four go to the gym together. Nice. Like, so the baby comes with us. So like, I'm getting the chance to do a lot of family stuff that I missed out on when I was working my nuts off right. as a 21 year old. Yeah, yeah. You know? So now, I mean, you got this job, it's successful. You can kind of make time for what you want to make time for a little more. Yeah, and that and that's been a struggle, right? Because like owning a business, yeah. you know. Uh, last year, I was talking to a friend of mine who had just come like and resurfaced because like his shop, he lost his first crew, and then like they rebuilt the crew again, okay. and he went into a real deep depression because that's something that happens in tattoo studios when like the crew you built with the first shop, like when people start going their separate ways and disagreements or you know opportunities. And then you're like, what do I do? And so now we're rebuilding the studio again. Um, you know Tim Schubert. Uh, I do, yeah. Yeah, he yeah. just he just started working here uh, today. Oh, cool. Day. Oh, yeah. okay. Yeah, yeah. He he just came onto the team on Monday. Nice. So I'm um, really excited to have him here. So you know him, Dana, Bill, you know me. We're like some of Melbourne's, uh, you know, tried and true, right? Yeah, we're a little family here. Cool. Yeah, yeah, and then I have uh, Lindsay and Caitlin, who are two of my former apprentices, okay. uh, amazing little humans who are really killing the game. Um, yeah, and then we have our piercer Mac. I, I tattooed him when he was fucking twelve, and our dad said we could tattoo him. <laughs> like, <laughs> Full circle. Now. Yes. Yeah, it's, it's so weird, man. Yeah. It's so weird, but yeah, so kind of okay. so, all that. Well, okay. Well, let's talk about the um, the coaching thing now. So okay. how did? I mean, obviously, you know, from what you've said and, and how it seems, it's kind of been happening anyways, right? Yes. Inadvertently, just through your own beliefs, your own attitude, um, and how you present that to the people around you. So are you doing something sort of more official with it now? Yes. Okay. Um, so I started the Rad Academy and my first program is the Rad Academy, powered by the Magical Motherfucker Method. <laughs> um, and so, interestingly enough, I was talking to one of my coaches yesterday, and he, uh, we were going through my, my childhood, and he was like, what I gather from your stories is you weren't really seen, and you were living in a room with no mirrors, and you couldn't see that you were a fucking human from that early of an age. And I was like, oh, shit! <laughs> So I think that's why, for for my whole life, I wanted others to feel seen, loved, heard, appreciated. I came from the time when children were to be seen and not heard. Right. You know, so uh, I, you know, the, the basic long and short of it is, it's a program help designed to help you remove mental roadblocks, uh, gain confidence, fucking discover your gifts. Like, and you know, I hope I hope it makes sense. Like gifts, like. The gifts that everybody's been in part implanted in them from God, source, the universe, whatever you believe in, but everybody's got some magic in them, right? Yes. Um, and my gifts are communication and love and, and guidance and, and like shining lights on things that you may not be able to see. So kind of bas basically cutting some of the hard time out of your life to get to where the fuck you really want to be. Because right. Granted, this last 10 years that I've been afraid to jump full into the coaching space, um, they, those years, they molded me, right? But if I had jumped in sooner, what kind of impact could I have sooner? Right. So, you know, I want people to be able to jump in sooner and kind of like change, well, literally change the trajectory of their fucking life. Um, so, yeah, it's just basically figuring out what kind of magical motherfucker you are and just giving you support and confidence and guidance to say, hey, you're fucking magical because of this, 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 and this. I fucking believe in you. If you can't fucking believe in you through this process, don't worry. You can borrow some of my belief until you can fucking hit the ground. Right. And so it's just basically like 
confidence on steroids in a, in a short <laughs> way. You know, um, I, I literally at this moment am immersed in over $50,000 worth of coaching this year. Um, <clears throat> I'm actually going to another coaching corporate program tonight that's starting um, because I just am so hungry to figure out me and then figure out ways to help others figure out them. Right. Uh, so, yeah, I just, all that that, that, I'm, that I'm going towards for educational purposes, and then all that I've learned from two divorces, uh, you know, close, opening and closing studios, working for people, traveling around the country, um, hitting a couple different spots in the world, like, all the things I've been through, and now being a dad of a 21-year-old and a baby, right. like, I've got a lot of life experience and a lot of little life hacks. Um, I've always walked around kind of pretending I didn't know what I was doing, uh, but now I realize I can't hide that anymore. <laughs> kind of know what the fuck I'm doing. Um, and that's a part of the imposter syndrome where you just kind of have to let that go. Yeah. Just be like, no, I know what the fuck I'm doing. I know who the fuck I am. You know, like, not, I'm not only stepping into my greatness, I've actually been in my greatness. I'm living in my greatness. And now it's my time to help others find their own shit. Right, extend some of that. Yeah, yeah. 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 Super so, exciting. It really is, yeah. Um, the first program I'm doing is a 20 person program. By the time this article is out, uh, we'll have already started it. Okay. Um, it starts on August 30th. Uh, but that is the first program I've designed. So at this point, I'm gonna start making like um, like Kajabi type programs where you can go in and just access the content and watch the videos at your own time and learn. Uh, I'm offering one-on-one -on -one, uh, mentoring, coaching type stuff where you know uh, the ticket price is much higher, the time is much more intense because it's us one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, and really, like I want to, I want to focus on people that are doing great in life and need to know that. Uh, you know, the people that are cracking the success code, the people that have cracked it and now are bored, the people that have cracked that success code so far that they didn't even realize they had to let go of old limiting beliefs, they had to let go of un un like unlearn old behaviors, but because they've gotten so successful, they didn't realize they had to let that shit go. So like, different levels for different, different human beings. Yeah, right. yeah, but like I'm, I'm developing a lot as it goes, uh, and I'll be the first to tell you I don't know what the fuck I'm doing. <laughs> I mean, I'm excited to watch the different transitions that occur <laughs> with this, so. but I think it's going to be really successful. It sounds really exciting. Yeah, I think so too. Yeah. Um, I booked half the program right now. I've got 10 people that are ready to fucking go. I've got a couple other calls I need to jump on to uh, see who wants to enroll and change their lives right quick. Um, and it's a really weird process because to sit here and experience the doubts and the imposter syndrome and all that shit constantly popping up when I'm like, no, I'm supposed to believe in myself. Right. Uh, it's been it's been a weird ride. The good thing is every coach I have says like, you're in the right spot. This is exactly where you're supposed to be. It's supposed to they feel like it's all down. Feelings. Right, yeah. because we're all fucking human. Yeah. You know, and yeah. so digging deeper into my past, I realized there's things that I'm held on to that I don't need to, that aren't serving me, that I carry around with me daily. Uh, so this path to making a purpose-infused business that doesn't involve me having to be at work, right, right. Uh, has led to so much more than that, so much self-discovery. Because like I'm the type, like I said, if I, can't, if I can't walk the talk, I may as well not fucking be doing it. So now I'm just like on a constant climb to be better, right. uh, which is cool. Um, and necessary. Right. If you want to do what you're doing, yeah. Yeah. Like you, it's, it's challenging others, but also continuously challenging yourself, you know? Yeah. Thank and you. you will probably learn a lot from them at the same time. Absolutely. So. You know, um, one of the things I've noticed lately is when there's healing going on, whether you're the healer or the person being healed or just somebody in the room, some of that healing is going to get on you. It is. You know? <laughs> yeah, it, it's just weird Like when you see that because you're hearing a healing conversation happen and then you're like, oh, that relates to me here. Right. You know? Yeah. So, yeah.
super cool. I'm, I'm excited to see what the future holds with this. So I Thank think it's going to be really successful. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, it's, um, it's a journey. Yeah. Uh, it's interesting. Um, but, you know, I don't quit. <laughs> so, you know, I'm going to achieve. Uh, I don't know what exactly that looks like, and I'm okay with that. But, you know, so it's a weird ride, but we're all on a weird ride. <laughs> yes, we are. Yes, we absolutely are. And this is the best version of weird I've had so far. Yeah, so. good. Well, congratulations. On Thank, you. Yeah. Thank you. I think, I think I'm good for the interview, so, cool. yeah. Cool. Awesome. I really appreciate your time. Dude, no I worries. I really do, because I know you are... Um,